everybody. We've been talking about arrays. We're going to keep talking about arrays. So, once you declare an array, you want its length, you have to use its name, followed by a dot, and then length. It is a property of the array, meaning it's a variable that's attached to the array, meaning that when you access it, you don't put parentheses. On the other hand, when you call link on a string, it's a method. So you do have to use the parentheses. They give a little helpful mnemonic. ANSI. Arrays, no. Strings, yes. Are you going to remember that? Um, just, just type it in, and then if you get a syntax error, you, you do the other. So arrays can be arrays of primitive data types, like ints and floats and longs, or they can be arrays of object references. And arrays of strings being the typical one that we, that we do. We might create an array of our own data type, right? An array of spears, or an array of, you know, an array of desserts, right? You know, candy, things like that. So a partially filled array is when you use part of the array's elements, but not all. You declare an array to be 100 elements long, and then you only use 50 of them. Well, why does that matter? Well, what if you were writing a program that would calculate averages in a class, you didn't know in advance how many grades there were going to be, so you declared the array to be large, and there's going to be 60 elements in it, in case that there can be up to 60 exams and homework assignments in it. But then it turns out that there's only 10. So, you add 10 elements to your array, and then you calculate the average. Well, what do you do? You go and add up all the elements in the array. Well, there were 60 elements in the array, it's just that 50 of them were zero. And so, you know, if he made 100 every single time, then, you know, I forget how many I said. Yeah, 10 times 10 is 1,000, but we divide that by the average of, you know, 6,000, and now it looks like he's failing, right? So you don't want to process the elements that are not used in the array if it's only partially filled, right? Just like if you have, you know, 10 apartment complex, 10 apartments in your apartment complex, and you only have six people living in it, six of them are rented, well, you don't necessarily need to go and, you know, clean out all of them every single time that you hire a cleaner to go clean all the apartments, right? You don't necessarily need to clean the ones that people aren't living in. It's a partially filled apartment complex. So you have to keep track of how many elements you've got filled in the array. And people sometimes do tricks, right? They'll, they'll say, okay, if, the, if it's an array of numbers, but if it's got a negative 999, it's an empty element, and I'm going to skip it. Or if it's an array of strings, but it's an empty string, I'm going to skip it, right? And you could do that, but typically what the textbooks tell you to do is just to start filling the array up and then keep track of how many pieces of data the array stores. And then if the array doesn't get filled up completely, then when you calculate the average, you don't delete, excuse me, you don't divide by the length of the array, you divide by the useful elements, the number of elements that have actually been filled. So when we added up all those test scores, we would just divide by 10 because there were 10 test scores in it, rather than the length of the array, which was 60. Now, why do people declare arrays too long? Isn't that wasteful of memory? It's because arrays are fixed in length, right? What if you thought you were only going to have 10 tests, but then it turns out that the person entering the data wanted to enter 12, right? Well, too bad. There's only 10 slots. An array is fixed in length. In order to expand the array, you would have to allocate a brand new array of that length and then copy one by one all the elements in there, and then that's a lot of trouble. So typically what programmers do is they allocate an array to the maximal reasonable size. Right? It's absurd to allocate too much. Like, you know, I, I'm going to keep track of test scores in this class, and so I'm going to allocate an array that's 7,000 elements long in case I give you 7,000 tests. I'm probably not going to, right? So that's way too much. But you have to pick a reasonable value, but it also has to be large enough, you know, kind of for your edge cases. So if we were going to do something like that, right, if we were going to declare an array, IA, right, and I'm going to put 10 spots on it, right? And then I'm going to start adding some values to it. 
I might declare a counter or an index, right? It starts off as zero, and then I stick a value in it. Okay, and then I increment count because now I have one object in it. And then I stick another value in it. All right, I'm going to stick a 20 in it. Increment count. And I'm going to stick a 40 in it. Increment count. By the time we get done with this, count is equal to 3. There were room for 10 numbers, but we've only used 10, uh, 3 of them. That's fine. So what if we're going to print it out? A for each loop would not be appropriate in this case because it would print out all 10 numbers. And you say, oh, well, why don't we skip all the numbers that are equal to 0? Well, what if 0 is a valid value, right? You can't just skip all the elements that are equal to 0. Those may be valid values. So instead of using a for each loop, you use a normal for loop, but you don't go out to the length of the array, which would be 10. Instead, you go out to the count, right? For int i is equal to 0, i is less than count. Like that. Then you can print it out, right? Print out. Like that. Then it would only print three. Well, this has a little bit of a problem if I was writing the code. Um, you know, if I cut and pasted that code, you know, too many times, then it would try to write more than 10 values to the array, and it would be a problem. It would crash. But as an example, right, that at least demonstrates the concept. So our array has, at this point, three values in it. So at this point, our array looks like this. Looks like it's IA is equal to, you know, 10, 20, 40. Oh, except in uh, Java, you use curly braces. Sorry, just walked out of a Python class. There we go. Like that. I think you have the idea of a partially filled array in your head. When you're calculating an array or you're iterating through it, you know, if you calculate in the summer, and whenever you iterate through it, you just use the number of elements that are in it. So while you're adding elements to it, you better keep track of them. Whatever you call that variable, I don't care. And a count seemed reasonable to me, how many elements were filled. If you had a data entry loop, we could write a data entry loop that would fill up those 10 values, but we might let them exit the loop early, right? Input, you know, a number or, you know, negative one to quit. They type in negative one. It breaks out of the loop. Well, at that point, it's a partially filled array. So we better have maintained a counter. So something like that. Let's create an array of doubles. I would say let's actually do it in code, but then every single time we run this, we're going to have to enter some input. Well, let's do it anyways. Are we already on lecture U? Is that what I'm calling? Q-R-S-T-U. When we hit lecture Z, do we just end the class? And you might use double letters. Yeah, then I start using double letters. Exactly. All right. All right, I'm going to declare an array of doubles. I'm just going to call it DA, ease of use, is equal to new, double. I want there to be room for 10. Now I'm going to ask the user for up to 10 numbers. So system.out.println, please enter up to 10 numbers. Just to tell them what we're doing. So while int i, excuse me, may as well use a for loop. For int i is equal to zero, i is less than 10, I should be using da.length, right? da.length, i is less than da.length, i plus plus, but I'm also going to need a counter because I'm letting them exit early for num items. 
some variable name that indicates that it's, you know, how many elements are actually filled. I'm going to say DA count. Initialize it to zero. Every time we add an item, we're going to increment DA count. All right, then we just need a print message asking them to enter a number or negative 1 to quit or negative 999 to quit, whatever our sentinel value is. And as long as it's not equal to that, we set that in our array and increment the counter. Otherwise, we break. So, let's do that. dot out that print line or just print enter a number or negative nine 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 to quit colon space in quote parentheses semicolon now double D is equal to oh, I forgot to create a scanner Okay. Scanner in equals new scanner parentheses system dot in. Add that class. I never choose create class unless you actually really intend on creating a brand new class. Right? If I made a typo and I called it scanner with three ends and then I created a class called scanner with three ends, that'd be pointless. All right. All right. So double D is equal to I N dot next double. I'm not going to write a more sophisticated one that rejects, you know, invalid input. All right, let's check. See if they typed in negative nine 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 nine. So if D is equal equal negative nine 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 then just break, or print goodbye and break, whatever. Break's good enough. Otherwise, we're going to add it to our array. So DA, excuse me, DA subscript I is equal to that number that they typed in, D. But we also have to increment our counter. DA underscore count plus plus. We don't increment i because i is automatically incremented at the end of the for loop. Well, why don't we just use i as our counter? Well, because it's created as part of the for loop header. And conceivably, you could create i outside of the for loop, and then you could use it by the time it gets down here. Eh, that's not really recommended. I can't give you a good reason why, but I've read that. Okay, I'd rather see an explicit counter created rather than relying on a loop control variable to be my counter. All right, if we were going to sum up these numbers or, you know, print them out or something, we would use DA count as our upper bound rather than the length of the array. So after our close brace, by the way, if you're running your program and you get the error into file reached, it usually just means that you're missing a close, close curly brace. All right, let's add up all the numbers in it. And we can print them out as we add them up. So double total equals zero. Just in case I want to calculate the average, makes it real easy. I don't have to cast it. Four parentheses int i is equal to zero. i is less than da underscore count, so that I only do the first three items or whatever. Semicolon i plus plus. All righty, let's add that to our total. Total plus equals. Now, to get the element of the array out, what am I going to type here after the plus equals? I'm not going to type i because that would just add 0 plus 1 plus 2. I want to get the value of the array out. DA. Yep, DA, uh, DA subscript i. And let's print it out at the same time. System.out.printline. 
da subscript i. Or make it fancy. Instead of print line, let's just print. And then after df, da subscript i plus comma. How about just plus a space? And after our loop, we're going to do a print line. So it'll go to the next line since our print's not going to the next line. And we can print the sum. So system.out.println. Let's do a backslash in to force it to go to the next line before we print out the sum. Well, I guess we don't have to. How about just a space? A couple spaces. Sum equals, or sum space equals, end quote plus total. So you know in these programs where I ask you to like find the minimum and find the maximum and the average and the total and stuff like that, instead of using dot length as your upper bound, you just would use the counter value, how many items you got filled up. If they get to the end of the for loop and they never typed in negative 999, then the counter is going to equal 10, which is appropriate because there were 10 elements, we filled them all in. Please enter up to 10 numbers. Okay, 10, 20, 999, 8, 6, 7, and then negative 9999 to quit. All right, so let's see what it printed out. It printed our numbers, and it printed out the sum, and if we were going to calculate the average, it would just be sum divided by DA count. I'm going to run it one more time, and I'm not going to enter negative 999. I'm going to go ahead and enter all 10 numbers. Due to buffering, I could just enter them all in one line. That's 5, 6, 7, 8. Looks goofy as heck. I shouldn't have done it. But here's our numbers, and there's our sum. So it still worked. That's the idea of a partially fill array. Anybody need typo correction? One more time to type. Anybody have any questions over the idea? Now I really have done the trick where I just initialize the array with some value that meant that that element was invalid, right? So if I knew that the test scores could negative, never equal negative 999, then you could fill up the array with, you know, all negative 999s, and then when you were iterating through it, if the value equaled negative 999, you could use it, otherwise you'd skip it. I have done that. But this is the textbook way of handling it. Copying an array. Here is how not to copy an array. If I come down here and do this, double new DA, brace in brace, is equal to DA. That does not copy the array. Instead, we just have two references to the same array. Just like we have two street signs pointing to the same house. Or we have two pieces of paper with my address on it. Right? We blow up my house. Well, we now we have two pieces of paper pointing to a blown up house. So, if I have new DA here, but then I set DA subscript 0, the original array, equal to some very noticeable value, like 876, 
dot five four three two one right. Now I'm going to print out both arrays. So I'm going to have two system dot you know system dot out dot print line comments. I'm going to print out arrays dot to string and I'm going to pass in da my first array, and then I'm going to copy that and I'm going to print out arrays dot to string new da. And I'm just going to print out the array reference itself. System dot out dot print line da followed by system dot out dot print line new da. So I'm going to just enter like three numbers, one, two, and three. numbers already. One, two, three, negative nine, 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 nine. Now this line of code changes the first value of the original array to 876.54321. We might expect, if we thought that this did a copy of the array, that the first one, DA, would now equal to that, 876 followed by a two, followed by a three, but the second one would equal what we originally had, but that's not going to be the case. Here's our original data. Then we change the first element of that array. And then our so-called copy of the array is changed to match. Well, it's not a copy of the array. It's just two references to the same array. We had two signs pointing to my house. I paint my house blue. Well, both signs are now pointing to a blue house. So what if you really did want to copy that array? You'd have to allocate a new array to the same length as the old one. Maybe you'd only allocate it to, you know, DA count, right? Then it would no longer be a ragged array. And you could copy all the valid values into that new array. That might be fun to do. Let's do that. We're going to create an array now that only has the exact correct number of elements to hold our data. So, double... Cool DA is equal to new double subscript count underscore DA. Excuse me, DA underscore count. And let's copy all the elements. Now, as soon as we write this copy loop, NetBeans is going to offer to replace it with an arrays.copy reference. We could just learn the syntax for arrays.copy. I want you to add the idea. So for parentheses int i is equal to zero, i is less than da underscore count, i plus plus, and then inside our for loop it's going to say cool da subscript i equals da subscript i. Cool da subscript i is equal to da subscript i. Now we have a brand new array, and if we change any elements inside of da, the original array, it's not going to change it for cool da. I built a brand new house, and so if I paint the first house blue, the second one is still whatever color it was before. We have two street signs pointing to two different houses at this point. We could prove that. Let's, let's print out. Let's change the first element of DA yet again. So DA subscript 1 is equal to, I don't know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then let's print out, oh, there was a point I wanted to make about my output. Let me scroll down and show my output. Remember when I printed out my arrays, I printed out these numbers showing that the contents of the arrays were the same, but then I printed out the array references. They're both sitting in the same address in memory. Even though they're two variables, they both contain the same address because they're both pointing to one array. Well, let's print out our arrays. Let's print out DA and then cool DA. So system.out.println. Okay. Yeah. Print line. 
da plus arrays dot to string parentheses da and then just copy and paste that and make it cool da in yet more numbers. One, two, three, four, five, negative nine, 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 nine. All right, so when I look at my output, here's what I've got. DA is at this memory address, and its values are these values, and then it's padded out with zeros because it's a partially filled array. Cool DA is at a different address, I don't think that's exactly a memory address, but it's a representation of a memory address. You know, otherwise you'd expect them to be real close together if they were actually, you know, the memory addresses and they were both allocated. But it, same idea. Then there's our values, but they stop at five. And notice that our second value is changed. The second element of the first array of DA has changed because we did that there. It changes to one, two, three, four, five. But by then, we'd already made a copy of the original array, and so when we printed out our copy, it was still a 2. If you were going to delete from an array, say you just actually wanted to nuke this value, rather than replace it with 0, what would you have to do? You'd have to allocate an array. Well, how many elements do we have from here? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You'd have to allocate an array that was 4 elements long, and then copy everything except for the first value into the new array. And then we would have an, an array that was four elements long and missing the first one, right? And then what if we wanted to append a number to that new four element array? Well, you'd have to allocate a new array that was five elements long and then set the value of that last one. You get the idea, you keep allocating arrays, you know, in order to do these insertions and these deletions. And that's really lame. And there's a better way to do that called an array list. I'm going to introduce the idea to you, even though we haven't hit it in the textbook. But it is so important. Whenever I am programming in Java, I wind up using array lists. Whenever I program in Python, I wind up using lists because Python doesn't even have arrays. It's because lists are so awesome. And in C++, they're called vectors. We'll, we'll hit that in our C++ class. Here's, let's go. We're, the syntax is going to be kind of weird, though. Array list. An array list is a class. I, I'm not going to even write with the definition on it. Array lists expand and contract to hold only the data that's in it. So when you declare an array list, it's empty. It's not 10 elements long, it's empty. Then you start adding elements to it. All right, but the syntax is weird. It's a little weird, you get used to it. Here we go. Array list, capital A, capital L, subscript, Double with a capital D, and there's a reason why I'm using the wrapper class rather than double with a lowercase d. And I'm going to call it D list. Equals new array list with a capital A, a capital L, two more angled braces, and then a parentheses and parentheses. And I'm sorry about the weird syntax. Also, sorry about that error over there, but we'll just go and click on it, and then it'll add the import for the class. Now, see, in Python, you just would have done this. DList is equal to that. Boom. We're done. Yeah, but <laughs> we're not in Python. Okay, so since I have that error here, 
I need to go and add the import for. If I scrolled up now, I would see that we now have java.util.scanner. And if you were clever enough so that every time we created a class, you just did import java.util.star, we wouldn't have to do that. Notice that arrays came in this time. Did anybody get the error yet again where after you typed arrays dot, it didn't add it to you automatically? Have we trained it yet? <laughs> Is it doing it now? I don't know why it does. And sometimes it does not. Okay. Right now it's an empty array. But we could add some items to it. Dlist dot add. Let's add 100 to it. Dlist dot add 200. And I'm getting error messages. An int cannot be converted to a double. Okay, fine. Is 100.0 going to be acceptable to you, Mr. Picky? Yep. All right. Apparently, nobody overloaded the uh, constructor for the double wrapper class. All righty. Now I'm going to do dlist dot. Add 0, 300. Now, what does that mean? Well, for one thing, I need to type 0 0.300.0, make it a double. This number is the index position. That inserts into the beginning of the list. These things append. Add is the same thing as append in other uh, programming languages. But here we said, yeah, make room for it, but make it the first element in the list, right? If we did a zero there. If I do a D list add one, it's, that new element's going to be at index one. Let's do that. D list dot add at position one, 400 dot zero. So this is insert into position one or index one. Now I'm going to add some comments here showing what the list looks like after each one of these steps. And we could be printing them out, right? But I'm not going to add print commands for this. After this one, the list looks like that. It's got 100 in it. After this one, it's got 100, 200. After this one, it's got 300, 100, 200. And what does it look like after this last command? Yep, 300, 400, 100, 200. 300, 400, 100, 200. That's really nice. That's way easier to do it than if you had to do this stuff in an array. Sure, appending to the end of an array is easy. Inserting into the beginning, though? No, you have to push everything down. You have to have a loop that copies all the values. You know? What if we want to remove these values? What if we want to get rid of the first element of our array? I hope I remember how. Fortunately, it pops up a list of methods. Dlist dot, is it remove? Ooh, hoo, hoo. You can remove by index or you can remove by object. Well, we don't know which object it is, but I do know what index I want to remove. So remove element number zero. Remove element at index zero. And so now at this point, our array equals 400, 100, 200. So array lists are totally the awesome, and I would always use array lists over arrays unless I had a really, really, really strong reason to just use an array. One of those strong reasons might be if you're trying to write the absolute fastest code possible. Arrays are allocated in contiguous memory, right? So when it's reading in the array, it can just read in a block of memory, you know, and then just step, you know, every four bytes is a brand new int real easy to get that data in, or every eight bytes is a brand new double. Whereas each element in our array list is a brand new object. And you saw when I printed out those two objects, DA and new DA and cool DA, which should have been right after each other because they were created right after each other in our program, and they were just, you know, stored at random spots in memory. We had no control. So if you're going to access the array list, it's got to step through random areas in memory. The first one might be here, and the second one might be here, and the third one might be here, and the fourth 
one might be right next to you know. So processing an array list is slower than processing an array. But you have to be really, 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 really concerned about speed to care about that. Java is not a fast language to begin with, right? And so, yeah, if you're writing in C++ and you're trying to optimize it because you want to write a PlayStation program, you know, and you want to shuttle this data around as fast as possible and make your graphics as fast as possible, sure, arrays are great for that. But the ease of writing array lists probably outweighs that because you can understand this code, you can debug this code. It is so easy to do this kind of stuff. Now you could encapsulate your inserts into your arrays and your deletes and stuff like that in the functions to try to make it as fast as possible, but I already told you, when you delete something, then you have a whole bunch of copying to do. And you know, every time you need to grow the array, you have a whole bunch of copying you need to do, and then boom, our speed advantages are gone. So that's an array list. I wanted you to see that so that the next time we see it, it really sinks in. An array list is uh, an example of what's known as a dynamic data structure, whereas an array is not, right? Dynamic meaning it can grow and it can shrink. There are other kinds of dynamic data structures as well. There's one called a stack. There's one called a queue. A, a queue is first in, first out, like people standing in line to get into a movie. A stack isn't first in, first out. It's first in, last out, or last in, first out. Think of a stack of paper. Right, I put 10 sheets of paper on it, labeled 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and now I'm going to get a piece of paper. I pull it off. I got piece of paper number 10. Last in, first out. Whereas if it was a queue, I would go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and then when I wanted a piece of paper, I'd pick up the first one. So, dynamic data types include array lists, which I could just shorten to lists, stacks, queues. There's all sorts of dynamic data types. And then you'll find out that there's more than one type of list and that there's more than one kind of stack and there's one, more than one type of queue. And you'll throw your hands up and you'll find out that some of these data types are thread safe, meaning that they lock the memory when they write to them so that if you have two simultaneous processes trying to access the main memory, they can't both change you know, the same piece of memory at the same time. And some are not. Anyway, conceptually though, you, uh, you know, you go with the simplest one first, and then if it turns out that you need to come up with, you know, a thread-safe version or whatever, then you Google how to do that. Anybody need typo assistance? Eyeballs on your screen. Nope. Too bad I needed the exercise. So a histogram. A histogram is a graph that displays quantities for a set of categories. I'll just make an example. I'm not, we're not going to even program it. What if I had a six-sided die and I wanted to make sure that it wasn't loaded to always roll a six, right? Well, I could make an array that looked kind of like this. D roll you know, and I'm going to do something that makes it look a little bit odd, but I would actually probably maybe create it to be seven elements long. Why seven when uh, I only want six? Well, I'll show you why in a minute. Okay, so I create an array that looks like this, you know, with integer d roll equals new int parentheses seven. Okay, and then I roll my die. I get a 3. Okay, well, I add 1 to 3. All of this stuff did equal 0 when I first ran it. Right. And so then I add 1 to it. And then I roll it again. I get a 6. All right, I add 1 to that. I roll it again. I get another 6. I roll it again. Well, maybe I get a 2 or something. Who knows? 
I roll it again. I get yet another six. I'm beginning to suspect that there's some, I'm suspicious that there's something wrong with this die. I keep rolling sixes more often than I should. And at the very end of my little test, you know, I could print them out. I would skip the first one, right? And then I'd just be like that. Print uh, these others. Now, the reason I allocated seven is just to make conceptually it real clear that this represents the die roll and this represents a number of time, right? I have a six-sided die. I don't want to tell you that I rolled a one and then update element zero, right? And I don't want to tell you that I rolled a six and then update element five. But in real life, you would probably only allocate this to the actual size you needed and you would subtract one from your roll. Or what if you were rolling two dice and adding them together so you had the values two through 12? Are you going to allocate your array to 13 so that you can actually use elements 2 through 12? Or are you going to subtract 2 from every roll so that it starts at 0? Anyways, this is known as a histogram. And you could print a bar chart when you were done, right? And if you rolled a die a zillion times in a row, hopefully the bars are all going to be about equal when you printed out your bar chart, right? Because it should be random, random distribution, a flat distribution. But if you don't, if one of them is markably longer than the other, then it's not truly random. That's the idea of a histogram. I'm not sure that we actually need to code. I'm not sure why I pulled this up. I think I was planning on grabbing the pen and writing, and then I didn't. So after we were done, we could print it out, right? Suppose you have three coins. When you flip all three, you're curious how likely it is you'll get zero heads, how likely it is you'll get one head, how likely it is you'll get two heads, and how likely it is you'll get three heads. You're curious about the frequency distribution for the number of heads. So write a main method that simulates throwing the coins a million times. Print the simulation results in the form of a histogram. You will have four cases, supposedly. You'll get zero heads, one head, two head, or three heads. And then when you were done, you'd print out the number of times, right? The number of times you got this zero heads would be that. The number of times you got one heads, and, and these would be random numbers, right? But this is the general shape. Notice that it's not a flat graph. It's actually what's a, known as a bar graph. If you roll one die and you keep track of the results, the graph should be essentially flat. But if you're rolling two dice and you're adding them together, then the graph is not going to be flat. Why? Because if you rolled two dice, there's only one way to get a two, right? And that's to roll a one and a one. But there's a lot of ways to get a seven, right? You could roll a six and a one or, you know, five and a two or three and a four. Or four and a three, or, you know, you, you get the idea. That's the theory behind a craps table. <laughs> exactly, right. So if you're going to go play gambling, you know, then, then some numbers are going to occur a lot more often than others. This would be fun to write this program or to type it in, but I think you already have the idea. You just call the math.random function. You pass in two so that you could get either a zero or a one, a zero representing tails and a one representing heads. Or we could do the same thing but rolling two dice and adding them together. I'd almost rather do that. But there's other things I want to do, so we're not going to actually test this one out. Searching an array. I almost think we did this. Did we not already talk about searching arrays starting at the beginning and looking for it? All right, say I have an array of three elements long. And, you know, I store red, and I store blue, and then I store green. And then I ask the user to type in a color. They type in green. I go, okay. Are you green? You say, no, no, it's red. Are you green? No. Are you green? He says, yep, I'm green. So we searched the array. We started at the beginning of the array, and we went to the end. You would use a for loop for that. If you got to the end and you didn't find it, well, then you have to return some kind of value that indicates that you didn't find it.
let's write something that will do that. But I'm going to go and stick it at the very top of main so that we don't have to keep entering numbers every time we do this. Let's create an array of integers. I'm going to call it Jenny because it's going to be my favorite number is 8675309. Alrighty, so int square brace, square brace, Jenny. I did that wrong. I declared it like a C++ array. I wish they had the same syntax. Int Jenny square braces is equal to curly brace 8 6, 7, 5, 3, 0, oh, 9. And now I'm going to ask the user for a target value. Except I'm just going to hard code it actually to make it easier. Int target. I want to find out if there's a 4 in this array. I need not a counter, but an indicator about whether we found it or not. And you might be tempted to just set like a Boolean variable. True, I found it. Or false, I didn't find it. But that doesn't tell you where it found it. Like what if we were looking for a 4 because we wanted to replace it with a 6? We'd want to know the index number. So I'm going to declare a variable called found at. But I'm not going to set it to a valid value, right? I'm not going to set it to equal to 0 because 0 is a valid array element. Instead, I'm going to set it to an invalid value. And if we go all the way through the array and we never found it, then at the end of the loop, it's still going to equal found at. And it is equal to negative 1, meaning we didn't find it. All right. So we're going to search our array for the index position of 4. There is no 4 in here, so it's going to be negative 1 when we are done with it. So, or parentheses, int i is equal to 0, i is leak less than jenny.length, i++. plus plus. If, parentheses, in parentheses, jenny subscript i equals target, so if, parentheses, jenny subscript i equals equals target, then yay, we found it. Open brace, close brace, and inside those braces, found at equals i, and let's break. We don't need to keep searching once we find it, right? Unless we're looking for the last position of it. I was just validating whether it was found, right? So I'm going to break as soon as I find it, because what if the array is 70,000 elements long? I don't want the loop to keep repeating and checking all 70,000 as soon as it finds it. It will have to check 70,000 if it's not in the array. All right, and so by the time we're done with the loop, we can check, did we find it? So if found at still equals negative 1, if found at equals equals negative 1, nope, we didn't find it. System.out.printf percent D not found. Backslash n end quote, comma, target. Else, we are going to print the target, and we're going to print the index value at which it was found. I'm going to change uh, the spacing of my curly braces just a little bit more stuff on the screen at the same time. All right. Else, system.out.printf, percent D, found at index, percent D, backslash n, end quote, comma, target, comma, found at. Target, comma, found at. A little bit too long to fit on the screen all at once. So I guess I'll go to the next line. Alright, so when I run it, since 4 is not in that list, it's going to tell me that it wasn't found. That is expected. Then if I change it and run it again, it should find it. All right, I need to scroll up. Four was not found.
All right, I'm going to kill the program by clicking the little run box over here. Cancel it. I'm going to run it again. Oh, wait, I didn't change it. It's going to have the same results. Derp. All righty. Let's look for three. Let's find out where three is in my list. I'm calling it a list now. I apologize. I'm going to look for three in my array. And if I look, three was found at index four, and I could count them out. Zero, one, two, three, four. And that's true. It was found at position four. Now, you search arrays so commonly that there's a method of the arrays class to do it called search. And there's another one called binary search. Binary search, in this case, doesn't mean zeros and ones. It's to differentiate it from what we are currently doing, which is a linear search. A linear search is a little when you're just going down the line. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Just like when I was looking for green. I started walking down the line. A binary search is when the data is in order. So you can speed things up. Like if I had this list, instead of A675309, and I had three, five, seven, eight, nine. And I wanted to find the uh, eight, just for example. You start in the middle. I'm going to check, and these, these are our index values, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So I'm going to go, OK, I'm going to jump to the middle and check. I was looking for an 8. Nope, it's not right. Do I need to go to the left or to the right? Well, it's sorted, so I know I need to go to the right. So now I'm going to go be halfway between that, because first I did halfway between 0 and 4, which is why I got 2. Now I'm going to go halfway between 2 and 4, which is 3. And boom, I found it. It took 2. Whereas if it was a linear search, it would have taken one, two, three, four searches for it. So, I'm going to rearrange my numbers a little bit. All right, say those are my numbers. I jump to the middle. That's my first check. Say that I'm still looking for eight. I jump halfway between where I just checked to nine. There is nothing anymore between those two. So within two jumps, I was able to rule out whether it was there or not. Whereas, if I had to do a linear search, I'd have to search all five elements before I found out, oh, Matt, it's not in the list. So that would be five searches as opposed to a maximum of two. If this is 100 items long, I'm not going to write all 100 items right. Then if I can do a binary search, because it's sorted, it's going to take a maximum of seven accesses. And there's a, uh, it's a logarithmic function that uh, gets you that value. I just happen to have that one memorized. And if it's a thousand elements long, it takes only a maximum of like 10 or 11 searches. If it's 100 items long and you had to do a linear search, then to rule it out, you'd have to search all 100 items. That's just like the guessing game, right? I'm thinking of a number between 1 and 32. You guess 50, and I go, nope, too large. And so you go, oh, 25. And you go, nope, too small. And you go, OK, I'm going to guess between 26 and 49. And you try to figure out what that would be. And I can't do that in my head, but right now, I'm 38. Yeah. And you zero in on it. Too large, too small, too large, too small. And finally, you get it. That's called a binary search. Works great far, far, far faster, right? Only seven searches to find out whether it's there or not at a max, as opposed to doing 100 to find out that it was there or not. And the savings become astronomically large, um, better, you know, if it's 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, whatever. Because if it's 100 item, it's long, and you can't do a binary search, then on average, it's going to take 50 to find your value, right? Because it could be anywhere in there, but if you did that search, you know, a thousand times or ten thousand times, then sometimes it only took one, sometimes it took a hundred. You average them all out, it would take an average of fifty. But otherwise, you know, an average of seven if you're using a binary search. Or if it's a thousand long, then it takes a maximum of about eleven searches. I, I forget if it's exactly eleven or what, but it would take on average, if it was a linear search, five hundred. Eleven 
way better than having to do an average of 500 accesses. So binary searches are great, but there's one drawback. The data has to be sorted. So that means that every time you add a value to your array, you have to sort it. That's expensive in terms of processing time. But if you're only going to build your array once, like you're reading it from a disk, right? You know, you have a thousand numbers stored in a disk. Then maybe you could read in all thousand numbers and then sort them. And then you can do binary searches, you know, till the cows come home, right? If you're going to be doing more searches than adding, then binary searches are great. Go ahead and sort your data. If you're going to be doing more adding than you do searching, then you're not. Now that's pretty much how databases work, except they don't sort the data, they create indexes. And every time you modify or add a value to the database, it updates the index instead. Same idea, something has to get updated. But since it's an index, you don't have to shuttle data around like you do in an array. So a database will hit the index and then do a binary search in the index in order to figure out where, you know, what item number in the index in the database to actually pull out. Sorting an array. And there's all sorts of different sort algorithms. Here's the worst sorting algorithm you could come up with. What if you had uh, 50 cards, numbered 1 through 50, and you wanted to sort them? Here's the worst way. Pick them up, throw them up, put them all back in the deck and see if they're sorted. Right? That's a random sort. That's absurd. You wouldn't do that. Instead, you, do, you might do something like this. I'm going to find the 1. And then you search all the cards, and you find a 1, and you put it down. Oh, I've got my 1. Now I'm going to do a two. You look through all your cards, you find a two, you put that one second. I'm going to find a three. You look through all the cards, you find a three, you put a third. That's one way to do it. If you were a kid, a little kid, you'd probably do it that way. That's called a selection sort. A selection sort, you start at the original value at index zero, you search the rest of the array for the smallest value, and then you swap the two. So if we had these values, 5, 10, 3, 20, and negative 2, and we wanted to sort them, the first pass, we go, okay, I'm going to search for the smallest value and then swap it into the first position. And if the smallest value is already at the first position, great, I'm not going to swap it. So we run through the array. Is My smallest value is currently a 5. Is this smaller than 5? No, it's not. Go. Is this smaller than 5? It sure is. I'm going to keep that in my head now. Okay, so my new smallest value is negative 3. I'm going to keep looking to find its smaller value than that. Is 20 smaller than negative 3? Nope. Is 2 smaller than negative 3? Nope. Okay, so I know which one I should swap. And we swap them. That's our first pass. Now we're going to search and fill in the second one. So we search that array for the index value of the, of the smallest item. We find it and we swap them. Now in this case, five is in its right place, right? So we search the entire array. We're looking for the smallest one. If we find the smallest one, we swap. And we didn't, so we continue our passes. We start at the fourth position. We search the rest of the array. We find the smaller value, we swap them. And then by that time, it's sorted. There are much more efficient sorting algorithms, but they're much more brain bending. There's something called quick sort. That, and there are uh, sorting algorithms that require recursive functions in order to implement. I believe quick sort is one of them. And a recursive function is a function that calls itself. The idea of a function calling itself sounds ridiculous. Right? How would it ever get out? Right? Sounds like an infinite loop. Let me demonstrate a recursive function for you all before we're out of here. There are other sorting algorithms besides this. There's one called a bubble sort. A bubble sort is you look at the array. I'm going to write the numbers. Except I hate that pen. Maybe there's another pen that's slightly better.
Suppose I had these numbers, A, 6, 7, 5, 3, 0, 9. What I do is I check the first two numbers. Are they in the correct order? No, they're not. So I swap them. Then I check the next two numbers, 8 and 7. Are they in the correct order? Nope. 7, 8. Then I check the next two numbers. 8 and 5, they're in the right order. Nope, I swap them. 8 and 3, nope, swap them. 8 and 0, nope, 8 still not in the right place. Swap them. 8 and 9, no, large, 9 is larger, so we're not going to swap them. And now we're done. That's our first pass, pass 1. We know. What do we know about this? Just like when we were doing selection sort, we knew that after the first pass, the first spot was done. And after the second pass, the second spot was done. And after the third pass, the third spot was done. We know that after doing the bubble sort, the, after the first pass, the last spot is done. So the next time we iterate, we don't need to go all the way up to 9. So we start over. We are, we're at 6. Are 6 and 7 in the right order? Yeah, they are, so we don't swap anything. Are 6 and 5 in the right order? No, they're not, so we've got to swap those. Are 6 and 3 in the right order? Nope, got to swap those. Are 6 and 0 in the right order? Nope, got to swap those. I'm sure I'm getting a messy finger. Are 6 and 8 in the right order? Yes, they are. We don't swap them. And then we're done. We don't check 6 and 9 because we already know that we have the right place. So that's the end of pass 2. I should have written a longer number, right? I mean, a shorter number. But it gets faster and faster as we go through. Five and seven, are they in the right order? Yes, they are. Seven and three, are they not? Nope. Seven and zero, are they not? Nope. Seven and six, are they in the right order? Nope. All right. And we were sure that those last two are in the right place. Now we know that the last three are in the right place. Five and three, are they in the right order? Nope. Five and zero in the right order. I've gotten, gotten lost of where it was. That's a zero, so we've got to replace that with a zero and a five. Five and six, are they in the right order? Yeah, they are, so no swapping. Seven, eight, nine. You can see that it's going faster. We only have three items to sort now. Three and zero in the right order? Nah. Swap them. Three and five in the right order? Yep. The rest of them are already sorted. All right, now we're up to here. Zero and three, they're right in the right order? Yeah, they sure are. Lastly, zero, okay, we only have one element left, so we are done. And now the data is sorted. Zero, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's known as a bubble sort. Bubble sort because it's bubbling to the top, right? The nine bubbled to the top, and then the eight, and then, that's another way. Those are about the only two sort methods that I actually understand and can demonstrate by drawing. The others get more and more and more complicated in order to get speed right improvements because sorting is something you do a lot in computers. If you go on to take a four-year college you know, degree in programming or if you go and get a master's or whatever you may wind up writing papers on sorting algorithms implement this sorting algorithm versus this one find out which one's the fastest and which one takes the most average and what's the worst case and the best case that bubble sort the best case is if they're already sorted right because you could run through it and then if you didn't do any swaps you know you're done so it would only take one pass to determine that you were done Worst case for bubble sort is if they're in the inverse order, right? 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Then it has to do the maximum number of swaps, the maximum number of comparisons. And you can optimize quick sort a little bit, you know, by checking to see if it had to do any passes or whatever. But it's certainly not the best. And I'm not going to talk about the best because, like I said, I don't understand them. I've had to program them, but when I programmed them, I had the pseudocode write a description of the algorithm. Fortunately, there are methods of the arrays class for doing all of this stuff. 
We want to sort our data. We can do that. Let's sort Jenny. Arrays.sort Jenny. Now let's find out if 4 is in Jenny. So, int f index, standing for found index. Or I could just use found at again. Found at is equal to arrays dot binary search Jenny or search for four inside Jenny. And I'm getting an error. I must have got the syntax wrong. How about just arrays.search? Nope. Java search array. How to determine whether an array contains a particular value. I love how examples go from the beginning to the horrible. Here's one way of checking to see if an element exists in your array. No. All right. Let's find a better way of doing it. I saw binary search. Arrays.binary search, byte array, comma, byte key. They won't want to check. Jenny's my array name. Oh, see, it filled in. Jenny is a second parameter. NetBeans was trying to help, and it botched it completely. And then look for my target. And then just take this print statement again, copy and paste it. We've already written it. Often you can get away with running multiple copies of it without killing the first one, but eventually you'll find weird behavior like no matter what changes you make to it, it doesn't change your program. Alrighty. So after it was sorted, three was found. Well, we need to print the array to understand why it did that. So why don't we print the array first? System.out.println Arrays dot to string parentheses Jenny. All right. And so it was looking for a three inside our sorted array and it found it at index one. That looks correct. I'm going to go and change my target back to a 4, because I know 4 is not in the list. So I'm going to, above my arrays.sort, I'm going to do target is equal to 4, just because I want to see what it returns if it's not in the array. And it's going to be a value less than 0. That's how binary search is going to indicate it. 4 found at index negative 3. So if I'd done an if statement, if found at less than 0, print not found, that would be the appropriate way to handle it. Why negative 3? Why not just negative 1? I mean, it's trying to tell you where it would be if it was in the array. 
it would be somewhere between 3 and 5. And so you count this as position negative 1, and this as position negative 2, and this as position negative 3. It would be between those two. Just trying to tell you where it would be if it was in it. That's why it returns a negative 3 rather than just a negative 1. So if we look for you know, some other value, like 10, let's set our target equal to 10. And run it. It's not going to return negative 3 because ne 10 would be at the end of the array if it was in there. All right. 10 was found at negative 8. All right. Negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, negative 5, negative 6, negative 7. So it would be one past it, right? If it had been there, it would be there. It would be at position 8. Usually we just need to know that it's not found, in which case you do if, right? So if found at is less than 0, then print not found. System dot out dot print line not found. Else print found. Just like we did before, except when I wrote the code, I made it so that the indicator, the sentinel, was negative 1 to indicate that it wasn't found. And we are about done. I don't think there's any need to do additional homework for this unless I was just going to have you sort your data, right? Generate some random numbers and then sort them. But it's so easy, right? You just call arrays.sort and pass in your array name and boom, it's done, right? So I don't think I'm going to ask you to do that. Hopefully the quiz asks you how to do that. And then to do a binary search. Why isn't regular search in there? Why couldn't I just do dot s and find it? What is Jenny dot pop up? And not too many methods. All right, how about arrays dot find? No, there's not find. How about dot search? Why in the world is there not a, oh, linear. It's probably linear search dot linear. Nope. All right. Forget it. It's easy enough for us to write our own linear search algorithm, right? It's just like two or three lines of code. Let's stop there. We won't do any homework. Y'all already have homework to work on, and I also want you to be thinking about your projects. So I'm going to try to only assign one piece of homework a week rather than two. Now, if I slip up and don't make the folder, and you don't tell me until, you know, next time, not that it should be your responsibility, then we're going to probably wind up with two things due on the same day. But other than that, we should have one homework assignment per week until the end of the semester. Except for quiz. Yeah, yeah. We're not going to have any more tests until the final. So that, that should be a true statement.